There's a lots of perspectives on who Jesus was, who Jesus is. Do a Google search on Jesus and probably don't do a Google search on Jesus because you're going to get millions and millions of things and some are just off the wall crazy. But, but God's word, the Bible, is where it all begins. And God's word gives us this perspective on Jesus, this unique perspective. But what's so wonderful about the Bible is it doesn't just give us one story of Jesus. If, if you've read the Bible, you know the first 39 books of the Old Testament, the next 27 are the New Testament. And when you start in the New Testament, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're all telling the same story, but from different perspectives, different vantage points. And I think there's something wonderful about that. I grew up, you'll see on the screen here, a picture of a, of a, of a float at the Rose Parade. Um, I grew up going to the Rose Parade as a kid at different times. We would drive up from Fountain Valley up to Pasadena where... Both my dad's mom and mom's mom lived in Pasadena. Remember the old Janet Dean song? She's a little old lady from Pasadena. That was my grandma and my granny. Um, uh, and I thought, I just thought it was about them because they both lived in Pasadena. But um, we'd go to Pasadena. We'd lay out a blanket. We'd stay for the night. It was kind of an adventure. You'd sleep the night so you'd have your spot for the parade. And you get to watch the Rose Parade from one specific vantage point. But if you really wanted to know about how, what, what that float was doing, what you could see, if you talk to people on the other side of the parade route, because there's different things on different sides, of the, we only had this unique one perspective. But when you get to, to the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's like four different people on the parade route on different sides looking. And if you brought them all together and say, what did you see? They're going to explain in slightly different ways the same event, the same floats, the same bands. But they're going to express it through their own perspective to capture the full picture. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are giving us this beautiful picture of Jesus. And if you want to know who Jesus is, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I hope you're doing that during this series. And I hope you notice there's different perspectives, but they're all a true picture, just true pictures through different eyes. And, and so as we walk through this series, uh, we're really going to dig into each one of these. Now, I'll just give you a snapshot. The Gospel of John, we spent five weeks in John, and John, one of, the, one of the aspects of Jesus that John leans heavily into is the miracles of Jesus. And so we looked at a number of his miracles, and each time Jesus would do a miracle, he would normally teach afterwards, and, and the miracle was setting the stage for learning who Jesus was. So Jesus speaks, and Lazarus is raised from the dead. And then Jesus teaches. I am the resurrection and the life. His teaching brings alive the miracle to drive it into our hearts and the truth of who he is into our hearts. You know, in the Gospel of John, you have this unique picture of Jesus as the, the great miracle worker and who he was in his teaching out of that. In Mark, that Pastor Sean preached on last week, and if you weren't here last week, go online and watch that sermon. We, we looked at Mark, and Mark as, as the serv servant son of God. That he was the son of God, God with us, but he was a suffering servant. And many people in the ancient world who were waiting for Messiah, they wanted a political conqueror, and Jesus came as this humble, suffering servant. God Almighty coming to serve. One of my favorite passages in all the Bible is Mark 10, 45. And that's what it says. And it's Jesus speaking about himself. And when Jesus referred to himself, he called himself the Son of Man. So here's what Jesus said. For even the Son of Man, talking about himself, even the Son of Man came not to be served. So take care of you, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's the heart of Jesus. A suffering servant who was the Son of God. Next week, we'll look at the Gospel of Luke. And I encourage you this week to read through the Gospel of Luke. But next week, we'll look at the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to see Jesus as the great storyteller. Luke has a lot of stories that only show up in Luke and not in Matthew and Mark and John. And we're going to have, I think, four or five congregational members, and I won't call you out of the congregation, they're already pre prepared, read some of the stories of Jesus and look at what these stories teach us and what they unveil about Jesus. But today, we're in Matthew. And Matthew, among other themes, Matthew is saying this. All through the Old Testament, for centuries, from Isaiah, 700 years ago, from all these different prophets, they're pointing to Jesus, and Matthew keeps saying this, and this happened to fulfill what the prophet said, this would happen. And in Matthew, we see this, this for all of the Jewish people who are waiting century after century after century for fulfillment of the prophecy, Matthew's saying, it happened. He's here. The prophecies have been fulfilled. 
And mathematicians have tried to study all the prophecies of Jesus from the Old Testament, written by different people centuries apart in different parts of the world. How could one person fulfill all of these different prophecies? And there's mathematicians who have said, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not like billions and billions to one chance. It's like words bigger than billions that most of us don't even know to one. It's just like unthinkable that one person could fulfill all these things. But Matthew says, that's what happened. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. So we're going to see that in the Gospel of Matthew. If you have your Bibles, open to Matthew. If you have your Bible app, just go ahead and search Matthew and get open to Matthew chapter 1. And we'll start there in just a minute. I do want you to also kind of meet Matthew because Matthew has an interesting story. We don't have a lot of information about Matthew Levi. But Matthew Levi uh, is, is, uh, was a tax collector who happened to have grown up in a Jewish home, in a, in a you know, religious, faith-filled home, but he wandered away. How do, I say he, how do I know he wandered away? Well, we know that he's Jewish. And, and actually, Matthew Levi, the Levi, might even be Matthew the Levite. If that was the case, it means he had priestly blood running through his veins. And his, and his family would have expected him to go into the ministry. But Matthew didn't go into the ministry. Matthew didn't become a priest. He became a tax collector. In the ancient world, that was about as far from a priest as you could get. Because the tax collectors in the ancient world had the right to take taxes and more. Whatever they could get out of people, they would get it out of them. And he was working for the Roman government, and the tension between the Jewish people and the Roman government was at a height right then. And he's working for the Romans, collecting taxes from his own people, where he would set up a booth on, all, on main roads, and he could just take taxes for anybody walking on that road. And he'd take some for the government and some for me, and put it into his account, and so he became very, very wealthy. We also know that Matthew was fairly well known where he lived. All the prostitutes knew where Matthew lived. Because when there was a big party at Matthew's house, he was very wealthy, the prostitutes knew where to go for the party. All the tax collectors knew where he lived. And then there was another group that came to Matthew's house for parties called sinners. And in, in, in the New Testament days, that was just a grab bag for all kinds of bad people. And when Matthew held a party, the prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners showed up. How do we know that? Because right after he became a Christian, he threw a party. And you know who showed up? Tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. All of his friends. And Jesus and his disciples. That must have been an interesting party. Right? Some of you are going, wow. Uh, but, but, but here's what I want you to see as we open Matthew together. Matthew grew up in a devout religious family and grew up with the scriptures. He knew the prophecies. He'd been raised on that. And he turned his back and he walked away. About as far as away as you could get in his days. He didn't just have like a couple, a couple of years in junior high where he was a little bit wild. He didn't just have like a few years in college where he was experimenting with things. I mean, he walked away. As a Jewish person, and potentially a, a Jewish person who had a Levitical background, a priestly background, to become a tax collector for the Romans and to throw the kind of parties he threw, what we know about him, he walked a long way away. So here's what I want to say. If you're here today, family worship venue or online, and you have a son or a daughter who you've been praying for because you raised them to love Jesus and you raised them around the church. And, and, and maybe there's a point when they were younger where they really seemed like they loved Jesus. But right now they're wandering a long way away. And you're, as, a, as a mother, you're right now you're carrying them in your heart. Maybe as grandparents, you're carrying them in your heart or as, as a dad. But if there's those people that have wandered far, what an example Matthew is. Because when he met Jesus and realized that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies, Matthew's life changed. Meeting Jesus changes everything. And so, Lord, we pray today as we open up the Gospel of Matthew, as we think together about your story, Jesus. Now, we, we've listened to John's perspective. We've listened to Mark's perspective. We've heard, now we're going to hear your Holy Spirit, you speak through, through Matthew's perspective. And we just pray this will continue to broaden our understanding, Jesus, of who you are and what you've done and what you want to do in our lives and through our lives. Speak to us, we pray, in your name. Amen. Well, we're going to look at some of the different things that, that Matthew unfolds about the Old Testament prophecies pointing to Jesus and how he fulfilled these things. If you're a note taker, you'll see in your bulletin or on your, on your Shoreline app, there's a place to fill in the blanks here. And also on the Shoreline app, there's all of my notes with all the blanks filled in. Don't look at those till after the sermon. Uh, but uh, we want to give you all those notes in case I missed something. You can kind of fill those things in. So here's the first thing that we see in Matthew, Matthew 1, The Messiah will be divine God with us. The scriptures prophesied that the one who would come would be God with us. Matthew 1.22 and Isaiah 7.14. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
So, so Isaiah prophesies 700 years before Jesus comes that this, that this Messiah will come, and the Messiah will be born of a virgin, and the Messiah will be God in human flesh. Those are two different incredible miracles, that, that a virgin would bear a child and that, that God would come among us. But Isaiah say, says that's what's going to happen. And so Matthew says, when Jesus came, this came to fulfill that prophecy. This is the guy. This is the one we've been waiting for. If you're reading Isaiah, at that point, it's written 700 years earlier. They're now waiting. They've been waiting 700 years. Grandparents saying to their kids and, and parents saying to their, their children, to their, to, to their grandchildren, they're saying, the, the Messiah will come. But not yet. But the Messiah is going to come. And generation after generation, century after century. Most of us, if we order something on Amazon, and we expect it like tomorrow at noon, and it's like 12, 20, we're going, what is going on? Seriously, what's wrong with these people? I mean, and we're doing on our computer saying, why isn't my pet, you know, waiting 20 minutes or an hour or two hours or a week can be torture for some of us. 700 years they waited for this prophecy to be fulfilled. But here's what Matthew is saying. This one that my parents told me about when I was a little guy, this one that I had turned my back on, that he came and he is the Messiah. He, is, he was born of a virgin and he is God in human flesh. He fulfilled the prophecies. Here's another one. The Messiah will come out of Egypt in a time of political oppression. In Matthew 12, 15, we read about the fact that he, his family had taken off to Egypt to get away from this slaughter of children that was going to happen because Herod had gone insane and was killing all the young boys just in case one of them might grow up to be a, a Jewish king to rival him. So he just starts wiping out kids. So it says, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. My son came out of Egypt. And that prophecy comes from Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That was fulfilled when the, the Israelites left Egypt originally, but it was fulfilled when Jesus comes out of Egypt. Now again, you have to look at this and realize the scriptures say that Jesus will be born in Bethlehem. But they also say he will come out of Egypt. If you look on a map of the ancient world, Bethlehem and Egypt were not next to each other. And there were no cars, there were no trains, there, were no, there was no uh, commuter system at all. It was a lot, so, so somebody born in Bethlehem, the fact that they would come out of Egypt just seems strange. But what happened is, Herod had heard that a, a baby had been born, a little boy who would become king of the Jews. And he was so paranoid, so terrified of anybody rivaling his throne he made sure that every little boy from two years old and younger in that region was just wiped off the face of the earth. And sometimes we read things that historically and we just kind of go, oh, that's history and it's just a story. No, this happened. And we'll look at that in, in the next passage. But the, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem that come out of Egypt. But then it says, the Messiah will come in a time of deep anguish and pain. That the human heart will be broken spiritually and broken kind of in a humanity, relational way. Because you're going to have all these, almost every family lost someone they knew and loved. Herod actually had these children slaughtered. And I, I was thinking about this. When, when, we, when we imagine what's happening in the biblical times, it seems so far away. We can't put ourselves there. But I was trying to put myself there as a, as a grandfather. You know, I have one grandchild, a little grandson, who's 10 months old. Had Herod come to this region to slaughter babies under two, he would have been included in that. You say, well, he's only 10 months old. He is part of our family. He is part of our heart. We love him. If something were to happen to him, his parents, his grandparents, his family would mourn. Imagine an entire region where every child at two years old or un under, you know, soldiers were sent in and they were just taken out and slaughtered. You want to talk about a time of mourning and pain and just hanging over the whole land. Because here's what you read in Matthew 2, 17, which goes back to Jeremiah 31, 15. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This prophecy, centuries before, is pointing to this moment when Herod said to his, to his soldiers, you go into this region and any potential rival king growing up with the Jews is going to be gone. Every two-year-old and younger that's a boy, you just, you just take it out. And it says there was this mourning. Jesus came into a messed up, broken, sorrow-filled environment. See, we picture if the Messiah would come. And the Messiah would come as a, as a ruling conqueror. He didn't. We picture he would come in a palace. Sanitary, clean, safe. 
Jesus came into the mess of our world with political tension. I mean, we have political tension in the world today, but nobody's having all the little boys in one region slaughtered. I mean, we're, talk we're talking about a level of political tension that we can't even comprehend, at least in modern-day America. And, and, and here, Jesus comes into the mess of our world. God's plan unfolds in a broken, conflicted world for Jesus and for us. As God unfolds his plan for Jesus, as our lives unfold, sometimes we look at the world, we look at our lives, and we just say, what a mess. What is going on? How can the world be like this? How can these things happen? And, and we struggle, but Jesus came into a world just as messy as ours. And he came to clean the mess up. He came to enter our lives and the mess of our lives, the sin of our lives, the brokenness of our lives, our rebellion towards God, and make things right. Matthew knew that because Matthew had turned his back on God and had gone the other way. M Matthew had run from faith, run from God. He, had, he worked for the enemy, for the Roman government. He gouged taxes out of his own people. He became rich on the backs of the poor. And, and he, was a, he was kind of party central and the kind of people he was around were not the, were not the kind of people that you, would think, uh, that you would think a good Jewish boy and raised in a good home would be hanging out with. But Matthew also knew that this Jesus could take a broken, messed up life and turn it around because he'd experienced that. Matthew was literally sitting at the tax, his tax booth that he would go and set up on the roadways. And Jesus and his disciples come walking along. And Jesus looks at Matthew, and he doesn't say, what's wrong with you? How could you do this to Jewish people? He didn't say that. Jesus said to him, Matthew, follow me. And Matthew packed up his shop, threw it out, and followed Jesus. And there's a lot of people sitting in this room in the family worship center online that you've done that. Jesus came to you and said, follow me. And in your brokenness, in your confusion, in the darkness of life, you said, I'm following Jesus, who is the light. And your life has changed. And he also says to anybody who, who's, who's like Matthew, saying, you know, Matthew was just hard-hearted and far from God. And he says to people like that still today, and he might say to you today, maybe you're at church because your mom said it's Mother's Day once a year, you, you come to church with me, please. I'm just telling you, this is my, that's your gift, show up here. And you're going, fine, and I won't do it again until next year. And even then I'll be like, oh, you know. But maybe that's, but, but, but Jesus says, wherever you are, he says, you can come and you can follow me. In the midst of our messes and our broken world, Jesus calls people out. Matthew knew that. And in his gospel, by the Holy Spirit's leading, he's saying that to the world. This Jesus you can follow even in the mess of this world. Lord Jesus, we just pause for a minute. And we ask you that you would meet us in the mess of our world. Lord, in a time of tension and conflict, sometimes our own hearts and our lives are so upside down and so mixed up that we're trying to figure out where we're going and what we're doing. Lord, some people are wondering, why am I here? What is my, what is my life worth? What do I offer to other people, Lord? We, we, may be, we may come even into worship today. Saying, God, are you there? And if you are, do you even care about me? And Lord, we pray that for each one of us that has come to the cross and received you, Jesus, we would be reminded that you have a, a way of bringing our lives back together, of taking the mess and making it something beautiful, taking our brokenness and healing us. And Lord, for anyone who's here it's never known you, Jesus. Or maybe they've known you growing up and they've walked away. Lord, may this be the day that they hear you say, follow me. And the mess and the brokenness of their life begins to come back together, beautifully put together by your hand and by your grace and by your leading. Jesus, thank you that you are the one who comes in the midst of the mess because you know us and you meet us right where we are. We pray this in your name. Amen. And related to that, in Matthew, we see this in Matthew 4, that the Messiah will come as the light of the world. Our darkness and his light meet. And guess what? His light wins. You can have a room full of darkness, you, you, you turn on a light, everything gets light. That's the way light works. Matthew 4, 14 to 16 says this. This happened to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, this whole region, he, speak, he said, listen, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Matthew had seen that light, Jesus. It had been prophesied that light would come in the dark world. I 
saw that light in the darkness of my life about 40 years ago. When, when I'm coming out of a non-believing home where Jesus met me, showed himself to me, and began to shine light in the darkness of my life. And from that day till now, he's been slowly just bringing his light into the little nooks and crannies of my heart where there's still some darkness at times. He keeps shining his light. That's what Jesus does. And the prophecy said, in a dark world, the light would shine. And Jesus is that light. He is the light of the world. He's the light in our dark times and our dark places and our dark hearts. And Matthew experienced that. He went from darkness to light. If you're a Christian, you've experienced that. And you're still experiencing it. Because there's still areas of your life where God is saying, I want to shine my light here. I want to show my glory here. I want to bring my presence into your life. Be open to that. And if you're right now, if you say, I'm here in church, or I'm online watching, and I'm listening online, and you, and you say, I'm not there yet, just know that Jesus, the light of the world, says, whatever the dark places are, there's nothing so dark that it scares me. Invite me in. Invite me in and watch what I can do. Lord Jesus, for those who might be feeling like they're in a dark place right now, who might be longing to see that just to somebody to flip the light switch and bring light to their darkness. Let them know, Jesus, you're the one who does that. You are the light of the world. And to those living in darkness, they have seen a great light. Jesus, be the light in our homes. Be the light in our workplaces. Shine your light through us as we walk in this world. And anyone who's gathered today or listening to this message that's never seen your light and that just has a sense that they're living in a dark place, in a dark world, Jesus, will you shine your light? May they cry out to you and say, Jesus, Shine your light in my life, and may they know that you're waiting for that prayer. Jesus, let us walk and live in your light, we pray for your glory. Amen. The Messiah will heal our brokenness. He's willing to take our brokenness on himself. One, another prophecy says he's the one that comes to heal us in our places of brokenness. Matthew eight seventeen says this. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, He, the Messiah, took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. That Jesus took on himself our sickness, our brokenness. The Messiah still has the desire and power to heal us on every level. Jesus has the power to heal. He doesn't promise that he will always heal how we want, when we want, the way we say it. But he does say he is a God of healing. Sometimes that healing comes right now. Sometimes it comes later. Sometimes it comes in the glory of heaven. But God is in the business of healing. And he he heals physical brokenness. I've seen it. I've experienced it. He heals relational brokenness. I've seen friendships, marriages, families blown to pieces. And I've seen the presence of the light of Jesus Christ bring them back together and restore. He brings financial healing to broken places. People have made just bad, poor decisions year after year and buried themselves in a financial situation. They say it's hopeless. And Jesus gives the power to live in a new way. I don't think he just goes, poof, it's all gone. He says, I will give you the power to live in a way, new way, make new choices, and find healing and find a whole new life. Emotional and psychological healing. God works in partnership with, with you know, pastors and counselors and, 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 and people that, that, you know, that have chemical imbalances, all those pieces of the puzzle. But ultimately, God says, I want to heal you in your brokenness, whatever it is. His hand is in that. And spiritual healing. Ultimately, God says, you who have walked as enemies that turned your back on me, like Matthew basically said, I'm done with the God thing. I'm going to go do the world thing. And God says, I'm still here if you'll turn around. And a new beginning. Think about this. Matthew, the tax collector who grew up in a good Jewish home, who had rejected all of that, who was living the party life, secular, you know, kind of just as secular as you could be. Not only did God save him, he was called as one of Jesus' 12 closest followers. Not only did God save him and make him one of the followers of Jesus, the, God chose through the Holy Spirit to write one of the books of the Bible through Matthew. Think about it. Oh, God can never turn my life around. Think again. Because he's done it over and over again, and he'll do it again and again and again if we'll let him, if we'll respond to his grace. Lord, some people here today, uh, they need healing. They need restoration. And Jesus, you came to deal with our infirmities, to deal with our sicknesses, to take our broken lives and put them back together. So Lord, I pray that the people who know you and love you in this room or those who come to put their faith in you, they would look to you for power to experience healing in every area of their lives. And Lord, often as we partner with you in that healing, we've got to make the right choices and be wise and humble ourselves and, and ask for forgiveness to heal relationships. We have to be responsible with our finances. Uh, we, Lord, we've got to be part of the, the work, but in your power, we can experience unthinkable healing and wholeness. 
Lord, many in this room need that today. May we cry out to you and look at your power and partner with you in this journey of wholeness and healing that you offer to us. And then the good news of the Messiah is still available to all people. The good news of the coming Messiah and his salvation is still available to all those who will call on Jesus. When Jesus walked on this earth, he offered himself, he offered his grace and his love to any who would believe. But that offer still remains, and all through the Gospels, we see the story of basically of God leaving the glory of heaven, Emmanuel, God with us, God coming among us as one of us, but never sinning, doing nothing wrong, and then God in human flesh being nailed to a cross and taking our sin and our shame and our guilt and our judgment, taking all of that, Jesus took all that on himself on the cross. And on the cross he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. On the cross he said, it is finished. It's paid. It's taken care of. That's Jesus. And he offers himself. God loved us so much, he left the glory of heaven and he came among us. That's a lot of love. God knew that we were separate from him and we could not find our way back home again. He knew that our sin and our wrong and our bitterness and all the things that that, that kind of simmer around our hearts are, are, are wrong before God. He knew that that separated us from him. And God said, that will not do. I'm going to solve this problem. And God came, Jesus Christ, among us. And then Jesus on the cross stretched out his arms and he took the nails in his arms and his feet and he hung on the cross and on the cross... He took our sins. He took our punishment. He took our judgment. He took our shame. He took it all. And he died on the cross, and all that was buried in the tomb with him. And when Jesus rose again, he left it there. He left it there. And he rose in glory. And he says, all who put their faith in me, all who believe in me, I offer this gift. You want to talk about a gift? All your guilt, all your shame, all your punishment, all your judgment, all your wrongs washed away. That's a gift. And Jesus says, I offer it to anyone who will receive it, who will accept it. Matthew, after we don't know how many years turning his back on God, he met the Messiah. And he said, all these things that my parents taught me, all these things I heard in worship, all these scriptures of the coming Messiah, it's been been centuries and centuries, and it's all fulfilled in Jesus. And he was changed. And that's what Jesus does for us, if we'll let him. If we'll come and say, Jesus, I accept you. So there's some people here today that you say, I've done that, I've received Jesus. Then walk in the glory of the risen Lord, the Messiah, the Savior, who is the light of the world, who is the healer, who is the Savior. Walk in his presence, hold his hand more tightly. Walk with him more closely, grow in love with him more and more and more, and surrender your life to him every day. Follow Jesus as his son or daughter. And some of you say, I've never done that yet. Then this could be the day. Mother's Day 2019 could be the day that you say to Jesus, Jesus, I don't have it all figured out, but if you came to this world, if you died on the cross, if you took my sins, if you rose again, I'll give you my sins. If you'll trade me my sins for your forgiveness and love, I'll give them to you. I did that 40 years ago. I've never been the same. I've never, I, did, I had no idea at that moment how much it would, what it would mean to take his hand and walk with him every day. It's been a journey every day. Learn to walk, walk, walk more with Jesus. But that day, my life changed forever and yours can too. Lord Jesus, I want to pray right now for those people in this room and in the family worship venue and those people online who have come to the cross. They've seen your face, Jesus. They believe that you are the Messiah, the Savior, the healer, the light of the world, the one who washes sins away. They believe that. I pray for each Christian that's gathered in the worship center, the family worship venue, or online, that they would take your hand more firmly that they would see your face more purely, that they would worship you more passionately, that we would love you more, Jesus, and that we would hold your hand and walk with you as your followers until we see you face to face. Jesus, let that be a reality in our lives that grows deeper and deeper with each passing day. And then if you're here today or online and you've never turned your heart to Jesus and you feel like, boy, I understand enough right now to say, Jesus, I give my wrongs and my sins. I offer them to you you, with what you did on the cross, paying the price. And I accept your forgiveness and your grace and your love. And I accept the invitation to take your hand and walk with you, to be your follower all the days of my life. If that's you right now, would you just say to Jesus, Jesus, I take your hand. I lay down my sins. I lay down my wrongs. 
I give them to you, Jesus. The price you paid on the cross, bury my sins. Bury them. And let your resurrection power be mine. And I will learn what it means to take your hand and walk with you all the days of my life. If that's your prayer today, God hears that prayer. He's been waiting for that prayer. And all the prophecies of the salvation of God through Jesus have just come true again in your life. And so Lord Jesus, now as we respond by singing songs of praise, as we respond by declaring who you are and the greatness of your grace, hear our hearts. As we give back now, as a response to your goodness, Lord, whether we give back in the offering plate or online or with an app, whatever it is, Lord, and our, let our hearts just be saying, Jesus, I give to you because you've given me everything. And I respond by offering to you out of the plenty you've given me. Use these gifts that the world would know the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior. We pray this in his name. Amen.